Wow, Stranger Things is really something, huh? I mean, in a year of terrible movies, Stranger Things is the first really, truly cinematic experience we've had this year, and it's been in our own homes. It kind of reminds me when I was a kid and we used to sit in front of the TV, we'd pop in a VHS, and me and my friends would connect with a, a cinematic world. We didn't get to see that often. Huh. Makes me wonder, what other things is Stranger Things going to remind me of? Stranger Things follows the kids, teens and adults of the small town of Hawkins, Indiana, circa 1983, as they struggle to get by in a world that seems designed to break them. This daily grind is thrown off course, and we see friendships tested, roles and responsibilities challenged, when the supernatural puts everything they hold dear at risk. So, sort of like how in The Goonies we follow a group of kids, plus a group of teenagers, plus some adults as they try to solve the central mystery, there's rules to learn, death traps to avoid, and bad guys to defeat. Here's the thing though, it's not a ripoff of The Goonies. The Goonies is just one reference in a sea of references. You know the upside down, that weird Silent Hill style dimension that is connected to our world and strangely influences it? Well, that's the movies of the 1980s. It's familiar, but it's all covered in dust, covered in cobwebs. What Stranger Things does that's so clever is it just barely touches these webs, just for a moment. Because the show understands if it lingers too long in this place, if it gets caught up in these webs, the reality, the story of Stranger Things, well, it dies. So let's take a look at those references and see if we can figure out our own personal meaning, or mine in any case. So, to get the obvious ones out of the way, the font of the title sequence is the same as the one used on Stephen King book covers, the logos of the police department are the same as Jaws, movie posters of John Carpenter's The Thing and Evil Dead are prominently featured, and most importantly, there's no cell phones. Those are tangible links to 80s cinema, but what about intangible things, illusions, feelings, echoes? Why are they included when they could easily be dismissed as cover artists or copiers or thieves? We have the kids fighting a monster like in It, a group of boys dealing with the dark realities of the world like in Stand By Me, or a girl turned into a military weapon like in Firestarter, or having enough of being taken advantage of like in Carrie. The Everything is a Remix essay series posits that new pieces of art are built by mixing together older pieces of art, and I have my own theory on how that applies here. But first, let's try to cover as many of these intangible themes as we can. Goonies, we've covered. Same with Stephen King books, also Silent Hill. Twin Peaks, though. Something strange is happening in a small town and only a federal official who trusts his instincts can figure it out. Akira, with its psychic teens, Explorers, a group of kids experiencing something greater than themselves. Monster Squad mixes together adults and kids dealing with a supernatural problem. E.T. Man, E.T. is a big influence on the series. I've seen other videos point out how much the series mirrors key shots and sequences, so I'm not going to repeat it here, but that's a rabbit hole you could go down for a while. I look at these references as touchstones or notes, symbols like a hieroglyphic or a constellation from which we get our horoscope. A single reference to remind you of another whole complete piece of art. Instead of a single homage, we get a multitude mixed up and put together, helping to create something new. I didn't have a huge amount of friends growing up. I remember times in my childhood being more comfortable just being by myself than being around other people. There's a comfort in being alone, you know what I mean? Wait, I'm not Barb, am I? The moment I knew I'd love this show was at the beginning, when Will lets Mike know that they'd rolled a 7 on the dice instead of a 13. This was important because it meant that they were friends who trusted each other, who looked out for each other. This isn't like Project X where everybody hates each other and they're constantly trying to ruin each other's lives. These characters care for each other, Nancy cares for other people. Joyce, Joyce cares so much it hurts her. It's alright to care about other people. It's okay to admit you care. Like a lot of people on the internet, 
Fiction often means more to me than my own memories. 80s films were about groups you'd want to be a part of. You liked the kids and explorers. Part of you always thought you'd have your own adventures at some point. That's the other thing that this series does so well. It uses character narratives, like Steve, the dickhead boyfriend, and it makes you go, ugh, Steve, you're the worst. And then what happens? Steve's a good dude. You go, Steve. You're not your narrative. When you're a kid, you think your life is going to go a certain way, a predictable way. And who you turn out to be is less idealized, but more interesting. You get lost along the way sometimes, but if you know yourself, you'll find your path again. Joyce knows herself. Jim Hopper knows himself. That's more interesting than if those characters just trusted in the bureaucracy of the world. I watch Stranger Things through a rectangle of light projected on my wall. Use all the right symbols, all the right icons to create a doorway. A doorway to the world of 80s movies. A doorway that I assumed had been closed, with nothing new or original ever able to come through again. But Stranger Things proved otherwise. It's like the doorway in the lab. It's a portal into something just out of reach that could give us something horrible, a monster. But when done right, it gives us a leaven. It gives us friendship, hope, a good story. It reminds us that when you're with friends, it's okay to roll a seven. I worry too much when making things. I worry people will hate it. I worry that people will take my influences and rightfully or wrongfully use them to dismiss me. And it slows me down, makes making things more difficult. But I'm getting better at it, making more things, because I've finally understood that how people react to it is out of my control. But the important thing is that I keep rolling that dice. If it's true for me, it might be true for you. There's more we could talk about, and perhaps we will in the future, but for now, seek out things that make you happy. Find friends who make you care. Be okay with who you are. You're made up of so many influences, but you're the best you that you can be. So take a chance, roll the dice, and see.